answer for Frank Corral to put up another three. But they have the big gun of Vince Faragamo. We have already seen it. He's not afraid to use it either. Under pressure, steps into the pocket. There you got it. Pretty. Oh! oh. Is Preston Denard. Oh, Preston about Preston. this. Who? Oh. Hello, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode nine of Connected by Seams podcast. Once again, the trio, Danny Espinoza, Garrett Smith, and Seth Smith here with you. Um, another interview in the books. This one with former NFL quarterback, played on a couple of NFL teams in particular, taking the Los Angeles Rams to the Super Bowl, and that's uh, Vince Ferragamo. Uh, really appreciate Vince hopping on. That was a cool conversation. Uh, he, you know, is yeah. a, a busy guy. Um, a lot of fun. And, but we were able to get a lot out of him that I'm not sure he's uh, maybe let a lot of people know of, of just kind of his career path and how things went down and um, the way he was able to just kind of stay even keel with all this madness going around him was pretty cool. Uh, quickness on, on Vince. He is uh, a guy well-established in the NFL had a long-standing career, played nine seasons in the NFL, a couple stints, as mentioned, with the Rams being from Torrance, pretty cool for him, uh, leading him to a Super Bowl, threw for over 500 yards in a game, uh, at the time was only the second quarterback to ever accomplish that feat, I think it was 509 yards or something ridiculous. Uh, nowadays, sure the, way that they, the way that they throw it around, it happens, uh, it will happen a lot, but he's just one of 19 guys to do that. Um, that's just his NFL career. He tore it up at Nebraska. He gets all into that. Um, and, and now his wine business and, and kind of what's kept him busy, uh, after work. I thought it was a really fun, you right away, just, he was just yeah. very loose, oh, comfortable. He, you could tell that, uh, he's, he's from he's our a very good woods. story. Very good storyteller. Yeah. We're very, finding very a good, lot like, of those. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I love listening to him speak. I, I enjoy listening to his stories. Yeah, I, I thought it was really cool. And again, he was such a busy guy to be able to take the 40, 45 minutes that he did to, to talk to us was pretty dang cool. So before we dive into the interview, uh, we've been trying to think uh, of something here to figure out a way for us to discuss our weeks. And I, I think we've settled on something. We don't have a name just yet, but I think we're going to get into <laughs> like something like our best worst of the week or our worst best of the week or something like that to where best of the worst, best of the worst, uh, worst. <laughs> we're still, you know, we're just spitballing we're here, spitballing. And, uh, tossing yeah. around ideas. Yeah. Uh, if any of you guys have any suggest suggestions, reach out to us uh, on Twitter at CBS pods. You can find us on Instagram as well at CBS underscore podcast. Uh, let us know. It, it's simply going to be a segment to where the three of us discuss our maybe high of the week uh, and then don't leave out the low of the, of the week. So with every good, yeah. there's a bad. And we want to talk about what was freaking sweet of our week and what fucking sucked of our week. Yep. Um, if you guys can help us think of a name, that would be awesome. But it's definitely something um, we want to try and get started. And who wants to be the guinea pig? I know Danny was oh, I'm going. ramping. Gee, you got something good. He's got Someone it. dive in. Let's get this started. I'm going, and only because I need to get it out before I run into something else. But you guys ever have one of those days that now has turned into multiple days and the week where I can't walk through a freaking doorway without slamming my shoulder or <laughs> – walking through a backyard and I freaking hit the same branch. I know it's there. Who put it there? Like yeah. I, the, but I, I keep do it. It's every single damn thing. I oh, yeah. keep smacking my head. I freaking keep hitting my arms. I keep jamming my shoulder. I, I hit my hand with the freaking hammer three times in the same spot. <laughs> like it's just one of those weeks. So that's my, that's my uh, contribution right now. So that's my best worst or worst best or, you know, However the hell you show. say. Oh, yeah, we'll what was what was what out. was the what was there a best? Did you have a best part? Was there a swing that you did yeah. with your hand with the was, hammer? Was that the best? Part? Oh no, yeah, that, that was good. I put together some <laughs> solid you know, okay, contact we'll on your fucking hand. Was the, was the best part? 
of the week. <laughs> hey, at least I, you know, if I'm going to do it, at least I square it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I put together some cool uh, some cool stuff in the backyard. So I guess that's cool. the, the, the good part. But, uh, that's but yeah. awesome. Well, that was a good first one. Nice job. Better than I yeah. could have done. Let's see. My uh, worst, worst of the week. Uh, I would say the probably probably got a couple, but probably the worst is uh, recovering from the bruises from the mountain ball bike fall. That's probably still the stiffness. Is probably, oh yeah, so still <laughs> recovering from the bruises on that one. I would say the worst is driving out to my farm ten hours, drove from seven thirty at night to seven thirty in the morning, eleven hour drive roughly. And that was uh, probably the toughest part. It wasn't that. It, it was bad. It just um, gets oh, that's just long. That long. Is, that yeah, can that's you long. hammer through it all. at night oh, like that, it. dude? 100%. I drove back. Fun fact: drove back from freaking Pennsylvania. Holy journey! That was so much fun. My buddy Addison and I. Speaking of ten hours, like that's that's what yeah. we were averaging. It was just like, yo, do you want to stop? No, I'm chill. All right, yeah, let's yeah, just you keep going, get, dude. You get locked in. The, le- the longest part of our journey was the four hours from Va- from Vegas to Orange County because it was like, dude, I just want to be you home. Know you're where you're at? Oh, you're so yeah. close. Um, but baby, open roads, yeah. like just cruising. Um, but we did most of it. We got started early, so we were trying to do a lot yeah. of it during the day. And dude, once the night hit, was yeah, it was hard, man. Um, I'm the opposite. I go, I go night to to morning. It's I know a lot of people. Yeah, there's no one on the road. Like you don't have to yeah. deal with shit. I'm usually that way. Yeah, I like yeah. that way better. And no, I would that, say on, uh, on this segment, I would say my, the highlight, and this is probably gonna get some people wrong, but the highlight was probably spending. Uh, all the time with my family, which is great, but also the highlight. I shot probably about thirty prairie dogs, uh, some whistle pigs, a couple. Ooh, of, uh, shouldn't have been standing there. <laughs> shouldn't have no, been standing no. there. Shouldn't be in my <laughs> field eating guy. my hay. Shouldn't <laughs> be eating my hay in the middle of the field. By the way, that picture. Uh, Find a new I home. think it was Ty next to the hay bill. Are you kidding? How oh, big God. are they? Just forty nine feet tall. Either of Ty is really hay. small, but or uh, those oh, hay bales are massive. Uh, so Ty, Ty is big, but we bail only three quarter ton bales. Oh my god! So not your little hay bales at the fair. <laughs> no, no, those things were. These are these are were this, gigantic. These are for like dairies and feedlots. You know, you take one big bale or two big bales and just throw it out there and cut the string, and it's easy for to feed. You know, yeah, a herd mass of, uh, amount. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. So, well, so, so what was your highlight? Oh yeah, so. man, highlight. I mean, it's cliche. It is whatever. But honestly, being able to just go to the freaking beach house, uh, our family, I think we touched on it on the last episode. Um, yep. I didn't get to go last year and it is, it's weird. You know what I mean? Like you go 28 years of your life doing something and then you don't do it. Uh, really it makes yep. you appreciate it the second time or the next time you get that chance. Um, so honestly, just finding all the time I can to get up there, uh, hang out with the family, nothing like waking up, hearing the, the waves crash and go get a ham and cheese, uh, for anyone listening, shout out, you all know about seaside, uh, ham and cheese croissants, maybe throw a jalapeno <laughs> or two in there. Um, so that, that for sure, uh, is probably the highlight, um, the low, honestly, and I just said it to my mom when I pulled up here. As you can see, this is not my awesome house. With that is my collection of bobbleheads, though. That my um, bobblehead, dude. It is your bobblehead. Yeah. Oh my god, that was in there. No way. Yeah, yeah. in the corner. In the corner. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that? It probably. Your is. bobblehead's in there. Middle dude. section in the corner. There probably is in there. I need to find it. There's some freaking good ones in there. Um. But yeah, we, uh, I uh, started collecting those way back in the day. But no, I, I just talked to my mom. I would, drove the 23 minutes that it took to get here from Newport and got out of my car. And I am so freaking sore from playing spike ball with my little cousins all damn day on the beach, dude. Like, I, and I, in the halfway through, I was like, dude, I'm, you're, I'm getting old. But dude, your boy, old, your boy so. was making plays. I tell you what, I like that game, especially on the sand. I was diving around. Oh, the sand's the only way to oh, play. Oh, my gosh, dude. Yeah. I literally sat down when I stood up to, like, walk in the house. I was like, what did I – oh, spike ball. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> hey, if that's the low of my, my days, I'll take it, dude. That's yeah, um, pretty good. All is well right now, just trying to stay busy and things like that. So, all in all, pretty, uh, pretty solid week on my end. Oh, Sweet. 
Sounds like um, a good week. Well, there, there well, it is. Whatever we the hell interview? this segment is called, we yeah. just completed it. Now it's time to the yeah. interview. We'll send it uh, to former NFL quarterback Vince Ferragamo. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into episode nine. Today we are joined by former All American, two time Sports Illustrated cover model, former NFL quarterback for the Los Angeles Rams, Green Bay Packers, uh, and the Buffalo Bills, Vince Ferragamo. Vince, thanks for hopping on, man. How you doing? Great, great, Seth. It's great to be on the show. And uh, boy, you got a lot of information there. Yeah, <laughs> you said man. that better than anybody else I know. That's what I'm talking about. I take got pride it all in out, that. Like, within like 10 seconds. I take pride in that. That's hard work. I, I, you need that the people good. to know. You did your homework. Yeah. Who time? I probably played before you were born, too. You did. You did, which <laughs> made, that, okay. that made it even more fun because I was going through your stats and the records and everything, just seeing yeah, the right. names. And I was like, holy cow, man. Like, this is pretty I cool. Know. So it was, uh, it was yeah. fun. We, we know you're a busy man. So um, we're excited that you hopped on and joined us. Uh, plenty to get into. We'll just kind of dive right in. Um, you're keeping okay. yourself plenty busy these days. Uh, main reason of that, the owner of Ferragamo Migneco. I don't want to say that in, incorrectly, um, but the vineyards that you run um, and up, up in Santa Maria, California, but you live here in Orange. Kind of talk about how important that is and why you kind of chose to uh, stay local like us here. Well, Oliver Mignecco was a was a client of mine actually in the real estate business, and uh, of course, his background is uh, from Italy, and he's from uh, in Tuscany. And we met here in Southern California. He had a um, a business locally in Anaheim, and so I got to know him pretty well. And we we joint ventured together on a on a little wine uh, business, and we started bottling a wine out of Santa Maria. But uh, that was when I first got started, before I became a sommelier, before I started my own company in the Ooh. Vince Ferragamo Vineyards. And now we, we actually grow some grapes here in Orange County, and uh, we're expanding our line and, and our production. Uh, we have five different varietals that we produce, and uh, people can pick us up on the website. We don't have a physical winery. We, I have my wine made um, in a different location, and uh, they do a great job. Uh, but the wines come from obviously Orange County, and then we do source some grapes from up in Sonoma in the Russian River area. So uh, we're we're very happy about those wines, and uh, they've been a they've been a pretty good uh, uh, pastime for us because my family's all got involved with it, and and uh, the the wines that we grow here on our own property in Orange is is kind of fun because that's uh, that's our pride and joy. It's named after my three daughters, Cara Vanessa and Jenna, called Caressa J. It's a super Tuscan wine. Very good. It was a gold medal winner at the LA uh, International Wine and Spirits Competition in Pomona. And so we're very happy about it. Um, and so we continue to produce those grapes. That's what makes it even more special, uh, full awesome. family affair. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what you want to get into. That's awesome. Right. You, you talk about your daughters, though, uh, family man. You grew up in Torrance. Uh, not too far from where you're living now. Kind of talk us through the, the early days of Vince Fer Ferragamo. How did you get into football? How, how did you find that early passion growing up uh, and, and kind of get your, your foot in the door there, tossing you know, the pigskin? And we're talking about family. I, I saw your brother Garrett just a minute ago on the screen. And uh, I grew up in, in um, Southern California in Wilmington area and went to Banning High School. I was All-American. Yeah, that's in the Marine <laughs> League and LA City Schools. So uh, it was it was kind of fun to to grow up here. My my family is originally from the East Coast, from Boston area, and I was the only one that was born and raised in California. So I have two older brothers and an older sister. My mom and dad have have gone, uh, but uh, they raised us. Uh, I'm, I'm quite a bit different in age. There was a big spread. My oldest brother is 15 years older than I was, and he was my head coach, actually, at Banning High School. <laughs> wow. I read that. Oh, cool. Yeah, That's yeah cool. Chris Ferragamo, and uh, he was um, a real instrumental in, I think, uh, in a young person's life as far as their development and uh, their interest in, in football. He really made it fun to play for him. It was a lot of hard work, so we learned a lot of great tools and skills that we could use in later in life. And he helped a lot of young kids in that area. It was kind of a, a lower social economic area in Wilmington where I grew up. And a lot of those, those guys went on to be very productive 
in business and in, in their own family lives. And otherwise, they probably wouldn't have did so well. So I really believe in sports uh, for kids. And I think it teaches us a lot Absolutely. about, you know, perseverance, preparation, uh, hardship, uh, dealing with loss and, and, and bouncing back and improving each and every day and, and treating everybody fairly and, and being a community. And, uh, so the sports is, is really the, the backbone of, um, you know, the, the backbone of good society and, and, and people all working together. So, uh, and if you don't work together, you, you can't be successful. And so I, I learned that at an early age and it was fun to play for Chris and, and, you know, right, being born and raised in Southern California, I think was, we have a lot of great competition here. There's a lot of great players, a lot of great athletes, and um, we uh, we compete against some of the best uh, young talent in the country right here in Southern California. So I was I was happy to do that and got a chance to later on play uh, back home in, in my backyard for the Los Angeles Rams. So it was a lot of fun. We'll now, get in, now get your brother. That. Your brother is your coach, and you know you said he helped you with a lot of skills. Has he or does he try to take credit for your all American performance? <laughs> not really he's uh he's really kind of a humble kind of coach. He always puts everybody else in front of him and uh, but really the 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 person at the helm, the person at the four stage the front stage of anything in business, the president, uh, our president of the United States, people who run a company, it all starts from the top and trickles down. And uh, it all started with Chris. He, he brought in gr great coaching staff. His work ethic and his hard work, uh, you know, taught a lot of the young kids, look, if you want to be successful, uh, if, you, if you want to, to play football, and you want to be good at what you do. And we're all proud here because the Banning Pride is, uh, resonates throughout the entire community that if you're going to play with this uniform, you're going to produce and you're going to pay the price and you're going to be accountable. And that's kind of what we learned at an early age. I mean, we out-prepared everybody. That's how – and we weren't really on the map back in those days, but we, um, we got noticed real quick because we were a team that – uh, excelled and did well. I mean, it didn't start out great my sophomore year, but my junior year, we went in the playoffs. We were one of the better teams. And then when I was a senior, of course, uh, we really uh, made a name for ourselves and Banyan High School was back on the map. Because years ago, when my brothers played high school football, they played in the late 50s and early 60s. Banning was a powerhouse. And then Carson came to pass. Carson was built and uh, they took a lot of the, the thunder away from Banning High School for many years because Gene Volnagel was a coach. But when my brother Chris came to Banning, he, uh, he came back to Banning and resonated that program. And uh, we were able to compete with Carson and Gardena and, and uh, San Pedro Lock High School, some, some great I'm athletes in, in the South Bay area. And yeah, so, but it all yeah, starts at the top. It all starts at the top. I know uh, you talked about what it teaches you – if that's one thing I took from football and why people ask, you know, would you ever allow your, your own sons to play football? And I say yes. And the reason I say that is for the eight, eight or so years I played Pop Warner is a topic toughness. Um, I chose to play baseball. I wasn't good enough to play football. I chose to go another direction and play baseball. But I think every sport from basketball, teaching you athleticism to baseball, your hand-eye coordination to football, there's one thing – that football taught me, even though I didn't play past eighth grade, was toughness that you had to get up. If you got knocked down, I had to get up from the coach. It's a different, it's a different type of world football. And obviously, you know, but like the way they coach and the yelling and it, it, it toughens you up. It okay. really does toughen you up. And I think that's very important for young kids. As you say, you know, athletics is so big for our whole culture for the United States. I think that's so important that kids do play football and they experience it for that reason there is something that even if you don't play beyond a couple of years there is something you get out of it for your life i agree you Danny, yeah, builds character for sure all different ways i i think so uh, and danny and uh, you know garrett you guys make good points because um uh, it really teaches you to car uh, compartmentalize your life you have different things that you have to deal with you have family life you have schoolwork. Uh, you, ha you have to go on the football field or go in go to the practice and, and work hard. So you have to make time for each different 
phase of your life. And, and w without that, you, you learn to live your life that way in fullness because when you're done with football, when you're done with sports, then you get married and you have kids and you have to go to work. You, gotta be a, a, you have to be a father. You have to be a trainer. You, get, you have to be a, a psychologist. You, know, you, have to, you have to be a husband to your wife. I mean, it takes a lot of work and you have to be able to break down each and every phase of your life and be able to uh, make it important to what you do. So I think sports in one way teaches you how, how to make time for everything and uh, to, you know, to be accountable for what you do. So yes, I, I do think that, you know, you guys had a chance to play some sports and you know, the benefits that it, that it could, uh, that it, it brings to each and every individual. More good than bad, that's for sure. But uh, you you found a way to to find that balance. Uh, you talked about putting Banning back on the map. Um, you doing what you did in high school. You took your talents then to Cal, where you started your college career, um, and then you eventually transferred. But going to Cal uh, was was there any special interests at that time that draw, uh, drew you there, or what took you to Cal initially after an All American year at at, at Banning? Uh, that's a good question, Seth. That was a, it was a traumatic time in, in my career, I think, because um, I had a lot of uh, an offers to go play at different schools. And Nebraska was highly recruited me. Uh, Stanford recruited me, Cal, University of Washington. And when I made that decision, Mike White was the coach at Stanford that year that they, they brought me to the Rose Bowl to watch uh, Dan Bunce play. And that's when I was a senior and they actually beat Ohio State in the Rose Bowl game. But I was very interested in going to Stanford. I mean, I enjoyed my trip there, my recruiting trip. And, uh, but the coaching staff had split up that year. And Mike White took some of his staff members and they went to Cal. And, and Mike was a great coach. Jack Christensen was, was stayed on at, at, uh, at Stanford. And so I was kind of lured to go to the coach. And, you know, I, I, was, gonna, I was all set to go to Stanford. And, you know, a big traumatic thing happened. I signed the letter of intent to go to Stanford and I was able, I went to school and the first guy I see is my brother, Chris, who's the head football coach. And he asked me, well, where are you going to school? He thought I was going to Cal Berkeley to go with uh, Mike White. I go, well, I'm going to Stanford. He goes, what'd you do that for? That's a mistake. You can't go there. So I said, oh shoot. So I go back to the post office and I retrieved the letter. I was what? able to get it back. No way. No yes. way. Yes. This, I'm talking this a long time ago, okay? This is in the early 70s. Oh, my gosh. And they gave me the letter back, and I opened it up. I scratched out Cal. Okay, I scratched out Stanford, and I wrote Cal Berkeley, and then submitted it. And that's so – Oh, I, my I God. To, that's how I went there, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Quite a traumatic experience, to, to, to say the least. Uh, but, you know, again, then it teaches you you got to make the best of what you do. So, yeah. But I learned, a, I learned a big lesson in life. And that lesson is that if you're going to do something, make up your mind yourself. You know, you have to make the decision yourself. You can't have someone else make the decision for you. And my brother thought he, that was in my best interest to go to Cal. Obviously, Mike White was a great coach. Um, it didn't work out because they were, we were put on probation uh, after a year. And we were put on probation from the previous coaching staff. So I, I had some success at Cal, but I decided to leave. They didn't want me to leave, but I left, went to Nebraska, and had to start all over again. So my career was kind of like a series of ups and downs, so ebbs and flows, because you're at the top of your game, then you're at the bottom. Then you start over and you go back. And so, but, you know, in, in all of it and, and how it all ended up, you have to take the proper approach, and no matter what happens in you know, through the highs and through the lows, you just have to deal with it and uh, teaches you how to be, um, to compromise and to, to realize what's really important. Yeah, that's crazy to, to stay as kind of steady as you were, because hearing you talk of how you said the ebb and flows and, and this and that, it didn't really change what you did on the grid. You know what I mean? You still went out there and you, you performed to the top of your ability and you didn't let that outside of outside madness kind of uh, dictate what you did with a football in your hand, which was pretty cool. Um, you talk about Nebraska, though. You ended up transferring. I was going to ask um, why why you transferred because you were starting at Cal. You eventually um, go to Nebraska, ranked number one that 1976 season. If you want to kind of talk about that, the expectations of going to Nebraska, 
um, during those years and, and kind of any added pressure or anything that you may have felt? Well, in those days, Seth, when you transfer, you have to sit out a year, so you redshirt that year. So I was able to preserve my eligibility for two additional years. And that, that actually, that one year, I was able to convince and, and, and you know, display my talents on the field and work hard and show everybody that, I, hey, I, was, I deserve to play. But when I went to Nebraska, I wasn't even on a uh, football scholarship. I actually was, was transferred there on a baseball scholarship. What? So I went yeah. out to, I had a, I had yeah. a show for baseball practice one day and then that was it. Then I went over and became, I went on the football. The That's Red funny. Iron. What? But yeah, they, the can't, system. They, I love they could it. not contact, they could not contact me directly. I had to be the, the contact person because uh, that way there, there was no collusion and uh, there wasn't no, you know, I would, there, nobody was stealing me from one hmm. school to another, but I did get there and I was eighth on the depth chart of quarterbacks. And so I had to work my way up all the way to the top. And so, again, it's a good thing that I had a strong background, a strong work ethic, and, and was, you know, they, there was no um, favoritisms when I played, you know, when I, when I performed. I had to earn what I did even at high school. So that, it just it came natural to me that I had to earn my, my way there. And then it also taught me another great thing that I learned with football. When opportunities arise, you have to take, get, take the best course of action when that opportunity hits. In other words, you have to cash in. So you may get an opportunity once, but if you're not prepared, you're going to lose that opportunity. You're not going to perform well. So you have to always be prepared. And luckily, when I was there, my first start came after Tom Osborne, who was our head coach at Nebraska, was, it was Hall of Fame coach. He had mentioned to me coming off the field at halftime after our second game, we were playing Miami. And in Nebraska, all the fans carry balloons to the games, red and white balloons. And they hold them until the, the team scores a touchdown. Well, no scores were scored in the first half of that first game at home. And so coming off the field, Tom Osborne had enough. And he whispered to me, he says, Vince, get ready. You're going into second half. That was my opportunity. That's another chance that I'd waited. And now I got to cash in. You know, I got to make the best of it. And, you know, it's a team game, right? I mean, uh, Garrett, it's a team game. You, you, you really, but it's, it's played individually, but everybody has to perform together. And when you have great um, camaraderie and, and great synergism between all the players on the team, then you know that's the right people you want to put on the, on the, on the field at one time. And I was able to uh, – uh, to produce and we had a great second half that game we scored a lot of points and uh, so that was named the starter from that point on and and that's how my career shot off I feel like shot that kind of happens quite often I mean like Brady it takes an injury and all of a sudden you're kind of thrown into the fire and I'm sure right. you can speak on it to where you're almost too dumb to the moment like you can't overthink it there's no time to overthink you just have to go out there and literally just let your your talents and like you said your preparation take over and I'm sure you can kind of attest to maybe maybe that helps you in a way uh, to not get in your own head or anything like that too. I think that's been a driving force for Tom Brady because he was drafted what in the sixth round out of oh, so uh, late. yeah bad body and, uh, too. Yeah, he goes to oh, New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback, and so he always had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he always had something to prove, and that was always the driving force behind his his ac actions, even at 40 years of old of age now. I mean, he's still driving himself because he's self-motivating. He wants to prove people wrong because they didn't think he was the guy. And then he became the guy. And so, but each and each year, every year in the NFL, you have to reprove yourself. You got to come back and you got to perform again. And so he's been tremendous. I mean, that's been the, the most thing that really sticks out in my mind as a quarterback to watch his preparation each and every year, how he just starts over from scratch. He doesn't ever think he's too good. He always wants to improve and get better, and that's what's made get him better and better for here. sure. Yeah. Well, you took advantage to uh, say the least your senior year at Nebraska. You go on uh, All American, but what I thought also was cool is academic All American as well. Um, was academics always important to you? Um, I didn't do my homework enough. I don't know exactly know your what was your major <laughs> or what what did you study? You know what I mean? Academic All American yeah. and to do what you were doing on the football field is is very uh, impressive 
If I'm not mistaken, I think I saw that you went to a year of med school. Yes. Uh, wow. Yeah. 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 How? Yeah. I want to know the same. How did I get in there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was a wow. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it was uh, it was an aspiration of mine. I did, you know, know, knowing what I know today, of course, I probably wouldn't have did anything different. But I didn't know how long I would even play, even if I would play professional football. I didn't even know I would play college football. So um, there were no doctors in in our family, but I felt I was kind of like a, a good numbers guy. I, I, I like mathematics; that was my best subject in school, and. So I, I chose a, a direction of integrated sciences. I like the science field. Um, I like the medical profession. I felt that maybe, you know, maybe if I go to school and I do the right things, maybe I can become a doctor someday. Uh, that's, that was my ambition early on. Uh, when I got drafted by the Rams and actually got a chance to go play uh, in the NFL, I was uh, attending Creighton University, which is in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. After I graduated, I graduated with a, a better than a B average. And so um, I, I was able to get into school. Thank God it was it was fun to get there. But I was only going one semester and it, it really didn't coordinate well. I mean, the timing wasn't such where I could stay with football and then do full time medical uh <laughs> Instruction Come on, and Vince, are you kidding me? Because it just it just wouldn't work out together, you know. There was especially no especially as a sound lazy, too. yeah. So <laughs> exactly. So you know, then my third year, we go to a Super Bowl, and so I said, well, you know, I'll put I'll put the medical thing on hold. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can get used it's to this. It's still on hold, you know. It's still on yeah. hold right now. <laughs> Well, that was the first half of the interview there with Vince Ferragamo. Pretty cool to kind of see how we hear it in his demeanor, but just so even keel. And it, it showed in his, in his performance athletically, um, being able to balance so much kind of change in, in his life and spontaneity. Uh, he goes to a college that, first of all, he decommits, goes back to the post office, crosses <laughs> out Stanford, yeah. puts in Cal, which, <laughs> holy story, that is freaking awesome. Um, so to hear that and, and how he kind of got influenced to make that change and then he eventually only lasts, you know, a, a year and some change before he ends up transferring again and going to Nebraska, who at the time top, you know, top program in the country and being able to to kind of finish out his career as an All-American. Um, so there was a lot of kind of a windy road, but somehow his performance on the field kind of stayed straight, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and, and when you're mentioning uh, his his crossing out the letter of intent and going back to the post office, but making that decision yeah. based on what his brother suggested and recommended on, on his behalf, you know, like for the betterment of what he thought Vince would want to do or what would work out better for him. I mean, <clears throat> he touched on it quite a bit. Having his brother as a coach, A, there was no uh, favoritism whatsoever, as he was saying. But he definitely and certainly learned quite a bit of not just football from his brother and uh, valued what his brother uh, had, to, had to offer from being a coach and implemented that into his everyday life and always, you know, getting through – um, whether it's through drills or school or, um, you know, just making decisions on his life. I think that's awesome that he, A, had the opportunity to play for his brother and to learn, um, you know, setting his life up or setting himself that's up for life with too, values, like you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and very, it's very uh, influential. And so it's cool to see that they had that relationship and not a whole lot of people get that opportunity. Yeah, it's funny that you talk about the <clears throat> the commitment. And when you said it, I, you know, he said, oh, it was a long time ago when you could do this. I was thinking, you know, when he go back to the Pony Express and ride his horse and ride the <laughs> pony down, <laughs> you have the ladder off of the oh, pony and, you know, man. decommit. I'm like, We're gonna, oh, come on. I thought it was just kind of funny. I was thinking about that in my head. Yeah. But um, what he was talking about, which kind of struck with me, was that um, – you know, football and athletics teaches you something. And I say it in the interview is I thought that if there was one thing that football taught me was toughness. And I think it's important for kids to play football, basketball, baseball, play all sports. I hate that kids, you know, they, um, they want to play choose. one sport now from the time that they're seven years old. I don't like that. I think that every sport has something 
to teach you. And he said that, you know, he said that football did teach him uh, life skills, not just football skills, not just toughness, taught him life skills. So to hear that, to hear that from him. And that's kind of what I had gotten out of having played football and pop Warner. I had kind of got the same thing or same look of, you know, what he was talking about. So to hear him talk about that was just good. And I hope that people realize that, um, you know, I think everything in life, it, it teaches you something you learn, whether it's good or good or bad, it teaches you something. And I think that he, you know, like he said, I think sports teaches people a lot in life and business and, you know, just throughout how our world runs. I think, um, I think sports are, are a big part of that. Well said, we'll send it to the back half of the interview with Vince Ferragamo. Well, shoot, let's dive into that NFL career, man. Fourth quarterback taken yeah. in the uh, 1977 draft, fourth round, uh, number 91 overall by, like you said, in your backyard in Los Angeles, man. What was that moment like? Did you have maybe intuition? Had they spoke to you that there's a chance you might go there? Was, or was it a complete surprise you're playing here in your backyard? No, I thought I would go to Green Bay or I was going to go, you know, someplace on the East go. Coast. <laughs> Yeah, the Packers, I, I, you know, but you never know. <laughs> That's the thing about it, especially if you're not the first five players picked in the draft. And the first round went by, and uh, some people projected I might go in the first or second round. It wasn't until the fourth round, and uh, it was late in the day. I was pretty disgusted. I didn't think I was going to go anywhere. And then I get a call from uh, Los Angeles Rams, and it's Chuck Knox on the phone, and uh, – I talked to Chuck Knox and he welcomed me to the team and talked to Don Klosterman, who was the general manager. And uh, they were very excited, but they drafted me because they saw me play in high school is what they said. No <laughs> way. Yeah. It was an interesting thing. Yeah, even though I played a career at Cal in Nebraska and had some success, they remembered my, my football uh, in, in high school here local in Southern California. And that was a, a very, very interesting way to, to go way back in time to see, you know, the, why they'd want to draft you in the first place. But I mean, place. But, obviously yeah. that means they thought you were NFL talent slinging the rock in high school. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> to, to like base it off that, that is, that is, yeah. Yeah. You might've been pretty good in high school then. Well, they were I mean, probably they, looking, yeah. They were probably looking at some of the throws I made. Potential. And yeah. Projections yeah. and stuff. Just goes to show somebody is always watching. Right. So, you yeah, know, exactly. you never know. I feel exactly. like I feel like they used to scout all sports a little differently too because I know talking to my old baseball coaches, like my head coach Mike Weathers, he was a um, great basketball player. Which Chapman, he was a great basketball player. They drafted they drafted him out of high school in baseball because they said his hands were so good. Yeah. They thought that maybe one day he could hit. He was a better basketball player than he was baseball, but got drafted per baseball because of his athletic ability. So I feel like the way that scouting used to go was just a different route. They looked at different things. Like you said, it looked back five years after you played in high school and said, we're going to draft him because we saw him play in high school. I mean, you wouldn't, who would have thought that not your career, you know, in yeah. college that they would have drafted you, but they're looking at your high school career. And successful. It wasn't like you were sitting on the couch at, you know, right. putting up all American numbers. Like that is, that's pretty cool. What a story. Um, but yeah. kind of dive into how the draft is now different. It's way less rounds. I think yours was maybe 12 rounds or it was yeah, in like one of the years rounds. that it changed uh, right. to 12 rounds. Uh, now it's, you know, even less than that. Uh, there was only three quarterbacks. I thought fun fact here, three quarterbacks in the first three rounds. Nowadays, if you're a quarterback, mm -hmm. you're going high. You know what I mean? So uh, if you can kind of talk about it, I don't know if you keep up to it anymore, or just kind of what the difference um, of, of then and now? Well, it's a big difference. Uh, I, I think the, the talent, and the, they're really looking for talented players. As a matter, I mean, the, the, the emphasis they put on the quarterback, it's, it's very valuable because he's the, he's the leader of the team. So there's a lot of interest in which quarterback is going to run my team and be the guy of the future. Um, but the game has changed quite a bit. When I, when I first came out of college back in those days, I think the Rams were drafting me as a developmental player that they would develop me. They thought I had some talent that who knows, maybe if I, we develop him, he might be able to play for us and, and become a player down the road. Um, it was some, but today's with, with the money and how much they pay these young guys coming out of college, they're almost thrust in the lineup in their first year, um, first or second year. So I still think that a quarterback that's coming out of college needs at least a year or two to develop. Uh, because there's still 
naive. They're still young. They're still, they're not experienced yet. They, they need that experience factor and they have to understand the game. So, um, and then the money factor, Seth, is quite a bit different. You saw what uh, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes yeah. signed for, $50 million a year, and now Mookie Betts, $30 million a year for 12 years, and $50 million. I mean, I made – my first year, I made $25,000. So, you were probably <laughs> so deal back in those yeah. days. Yeah. But, uh, it, yeah, it's, so it's just – yeah, it's just, the, the, there's a big discrepancy today. And, uh, you know, there's – it's, it's – um, it's a business. Many people always said football, all major league sports are, are big business, and it really is. Uh, but you, you, as an athlete, you just want to be treated fairly, you know, and just have – you want to have be treated with respect. And uh, and when I first came in the league, too bad there wasn't free agency we had in, in, uh, in the NFL back in those days. We Guys like myself had to show everybody else that, you know, free agency is the way to go. And it's the, it's the only way to, to, to keep uh, the players motivated and, and uh, to, to strive for excellence because if one team's not going to pay you, somebody else may pay you. Uh, but I'm kind of old-fashioned. I like to see players stay with the same team. Uh, and we do, we do in a lot of respects. We saw Tom Brady stay with the same team for – most of his entire career, almost 20 years. So, and you love I mean, that it right didn't now end on bad terms, you know, it, it wasn't yeah. like that he got forced out of there. It wasn't, you know, it, it seems like right. everything was kind of peachy and you love to see that after a guy's given so much for so many years like that. Yeah. And well, it's, it's, I think his departure fired him up, to be honest. I think he is, I think he might be a little. He's sore, got his boy back. Are you kidding me? Him and Gronk yeah, tearing that's through true. Tampa Yeah, Bay. he does. He does. <laughs> oh, he's yeah, big fired combination. Up. Yeah, he's fired yeah, up. Yeah, Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians is a good coach. He's love offensive Bruce. coach. So he loves quarterbacks. So love Bruce. He was huge yeah. for the Colts. Yeah, he's a fun dude. Um, but kind of back to to your direction here. You spent two stints with the Rams. Uh, played for the Packers, the Bills. Um, let's talk about that exciting 1979 year, though. Again, started the year yeah. as a backup. You then became the first quarterback to start a Super Bowl in the same season as your first career start. Um, again, no time to think about it. Dive right into it, thrown into the fire. You end up leading the Rams to the Super Bowl and play in Pasadena. Um, take us along that magical ride there in 1979. In 79, it was, it was a magical year. Obviously, the, the team had been building, building, building for so many years. Great, great defenses, uh, great, uh, great coaches, but we, they could never get past that hurdle of the NFC championship game. They always lost to Minnesota or lost to Dallas. And for, for some reason, that particular year was magical because the right players were on the team at the right time. I mean, we had the chemistry. Uh, they, when I actually went in the lineup, it's a, it's a, fun, it's a weird thing how things turned out because we played Dallas the third game of the season that year and they they beat us really bad in Dallas and at the end of that game they put me in the game and I broke my hand so it was I was really down and out it was almost a low one of the low parts of my entire career not getting a chance to play didn't think I would ever play working hard and tr and trying to improve all the time then something bad happens to you and now when your chances are starting to open up a little bit now my hand is hurt now I can't play so four weeks went by, and then uh, we were playing on a Monday night game. We were five and six. We played Atlanta Falcons at the Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles, and that was my first start on Monday night football. And that was with Howard Cosell behind the so microphone. So freaking and, rad. Uh, I was on the field. It was a big thrill. We, we went on, and uh, we, we kind of blistered the Atlanta. We beat them, and we went on in a win streak that year and just things just started to roll. We started to get on a roll and everybody's feeling good. And, you know, Hey, the Rams have a quarterback and you know, that they're on a roll. They got a defense they're, they're beating everybody. And then we got into the playoffs. We were nine and seven and we won our division. We, we had to go to Dallas and play Dallas our first game. And that was the, that was the, uh, the, the real turning point uh, because we've always got beat by Dallas in the playoffs. And, but as things would have it, Eight weeks prior to that, I broke my hand at that same stadium. We came back to that same stadium, and we beat Dallas in the last two minutes of the game. And what a thrill that was. I mean, the, the Billy Waddy, the Wendell Tyler, the Ron Smith catches, and the way our defense played, and they held Roger Staubach at the end of the game to, to not move the ball. 
we were we were really a team to be reckoned with, and uh, it was it was a Super Bowl team for sure. And we went on the next week to play a really good Tampa Bay team. They have probably – their defensive talent was just remarkable. I mean, they were like superhuman. They had Batman, Richard Wood, and they had David Lewis, and uh, they had the Selman brothers, and they, they were stacked on defense. And then they had, they had Doug uh, – um, oh, shoot, how come I can't remember? Doug from, uh, from Grambling. Doug Williams. Doug Williams is the quarterback. I mean, a great quarterback. And, and uh, it was coached by uh, the great coach from USC. Um, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, geez, I can't even remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I mean, they, they, they did a great job. They, we, we ended up winning the game nine to nothing. We didn't even score a touchdown. We scored one touchdown, but they called it back. But wow. uh, we, after that game, you know, history was made, and we went on to play in the Super Bowl. So it was um, – the games leading up to the Super Bowl are so important and so big that that's what made it such a great season. Yeah, that is so cool. You can wrap, yeah, you wrap Let's talk you about your wrap, wine. Yeah, you I want to talk about your wine, Vince. Okay. Um, uh, just kind of what how people can get it and stuff like that. Yeah, Seth, it's, uh, it's a winery. The, the website is vinceferragamovineyards.com. And we grow the grapes, the Sangiovese and Cabernet grapes right here in Orange County on our property. And uh, that's, that's our signature wine. It's named after my three daughters, Cara Vanessa and Jenna, called Caressa J. Uh, we also have a Chardonnay uh, that uh, we produce, but we don't grow the grapes. We have it made. A friend of mine makes that wine, and that's Anna Stella. Anna, these, are, uh, these names of my wines are all women in my life that were very meaningful to me. Uh, Anna is my... Uh, Anna Cuzio is my grandmother's name, and Stella is my mom's name. So Anna Cuzio, so Anna Stella is the uh, beautiful Chardonnay we make. It's Burgundian style. Uh, we have a beautiful Primitivo that's made up at uh, up north in Sonoma uh, that we call Raffaella. That's my uh, auntie Raffi, which is uh, my mom's sister, and they were uh, dueling back and forth the entire time. Performed on stage, um, and. Um, the uh, the Pinot no uh, Nero, which is a Pinot Noir, it's grown in Sonoma as well, the Russian River, and it's named after my granddaughter Sophie Francesca, called Sophie Francesca, Sophia Francesca. It really is I a love full that family affair. Yeah, that yeah. is so yeah, cool. And then my wife, yeah, my wife has a wine. We have a, a rosé sparkling wine after uh, my wife jo Jody, and she's Josephina in uh, Sicilian. That's that's how you say Jody in in Sicilian. That's awesome. So it's called so Josephina. awesome. Well, I read that you have a 2000 bottle seller at home, so I know you enjoy your wine. I hope you enjoy a, a nice cup. I hope you en uh, enjoy a, a glass, nice glass. A glass. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, you can see how much wine night, clearly I night, drink. Seth. Clearly, I drink a lot. Pasta, you know, with a good, good a cup of fucking wine. Also. Come on. Uh, go enjoy a glass. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Vince. We really appreciate it. This was a blast, man. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Vince. Up, Thanks, man. Vince. Nice meeting you. Take, Take care. care. See ya. So that is the conclusion there of the interview with Vince Ferragamo. Uh, again, appreciate Vince taking the time. So cool. There was so much more we even could have asked the guy. Um, fortunate to have the time that we did. Um, accomplished a lot in his career. We didn't even get into his uh, little stint on Hawaii Five O as an actor. Um, everything that, <laughs> everything else that he has been involved with. We mentioned the two-time Sports Illustrated. Uh, that was in a span of eight months. People play their whole career and can't even get on there. So, so yeah. accomplished. He did so much, especially in our area. Very well known. I thought it was a great interview. If you guys want to um, catch up and and wrap it up there. Yeah, and he, you know he hammered it out quite a bit in there, but just the values that he learned playing playing the game and playing sports, and and you know how he implemented that to earning his playing time, and and he translated to always being prepared, and uh, always being prepared going to med school. I mean, just in case sports didn't work out, you know, and yep. valuing what life would be, and. Uh, with or without sports. I think that was tremendous, uh, just preparation and uh, having the mindset to do so. And also uh, the fact that he brings his family and makes, makes wine and makes wine a family event. I think that's awesome. Yeah, very cool. I think it's cool to have his whole family involved with his wine. Um, 
you know, uh, it's, it's cool to, to be able to work with your family for that long. But what I thought was cool is when he talked about the draft, having gone through the draft as a, as an athlete as well. Uh, it was cool to hear him talk about the frustrations. I remember being frustrated and having like, Oh, this team's going to pick me. Nope. Psych. Then you go, you know, another <laughs> round passes, you know? So I thought it was cool for him to talk about it and the frustration he had, you know, when he got picked, he was finally, he was so fresh. It was like, he almost didn't care. It was late in the day and it was kind of like, ah, I'm frustrated with the day. And then bam, team in his backyard drafts him. I mean, pretty cool. And then he says, no, they didn't even draft me off my college career. They said, they just saw me throw, you know, play, uh, play football in high school. So that was even kind of a little twist on, on why they drafted him. So I thought that was cool. Everything yeah. happens for a reason. Yep. Yep. So cool. Well, we appreciate the time from Vince. That's episode nine. Now done. A reminder, join us next week, episode 10. Uh, find us on all social media, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Bo- or review, rate us, all that. Subscribe to our page on YouTube. But that does it here on episode nine. For Danny, Garrett, and Seth, we out. Catch you on the flip side.